Hello, friends, and welcome to the Bikes or Death podcast. As always, my name is Patrick, and I'm your host. And I'd like to start off today's episode by thanking our newest patrons. We had uh, quite a few sign up. So we got Nick L., Liam O., Laura J., Jonathan O., and Abby R. Thank you all so much for uh, signing up as sustaining members over at Patreon. And thank you for helping us get closer to our goal of $500 a month at which time I am going to release a patron-only podcast as a way to say thank you and give you all some extra groovy content to stimulate your earbuds and your minds. I just made that up. Right now, we're sitting at $455, so only $45 away from the goal. I'm hoping to get there soon because in January, I'm going to be participating in dry January. No booze, no alcohol for the month of January, and... uh, thought it might be fun to kind of chronologue my journey for the month of January and uh, maybe we can get a little support group going over on Patreon and maybe some people want to join in with me. If you would like to support the show, uh, you can head over to bikesordeath.com. Got all the links there, made it super easy. And while you're there, check out the new website. I'm really proud of this website. Uh, It was built by bikepackers, built by listeners and fans of the show. If you'd like to learn more about the Bikes or Death team that we got over here, check out the About page. Um, We got a little bio and a picture of everybody on the team so you can get to know them a little bit more. Uh, It's been so cool to kind of put together a little team and and, uh, and really get some help. 2021 is going to be a big year. Super excited, but uh, we're not there yet, so let's focus on the present. And in the present, today's episode is brought to you by Gooder Sunglasses. You've heard me talk about them before. That's because they're awesome. They look cool, lightweight, polarized, and they don't cost a lot of money. What I mean by not a lot of money is All of their sunglasses can be purchased for $25 to $35. So they're super affordable, which is one of my favorite things about them. But they can't just be affordable. They got to look good, too. They got to be groovy. You know that. I'm a social media influencer now. I got to look on point all the time. Can't be caught slipping with some busted up sunglasses on, right? So (laughs) if you want to see what I'm wearing Uh, Some of the styles that I have, uh, Gooder set up a landing page. You can uh, check them out at gooder.com. That's G-O-O-D-R, no E, dot com forward slash bikes or death. You can check out some of the styles that I'm wearing. uh, But while you're there, peruse their website and uh, check out the names of the sunglasses. I think you'll find them entertaining. Uh, Some of them are sunbathing with wizards. You could get yourself a pair of the uh, Whiskey Shots with Satan, perhaps. Or uh, maybe the uh, Donkey Goggles. Those look nice. So if you're looking for some really nice sunglasses that look awesome and don't cost a lot of money, head over to Gooder.com, check them out. Make sure to check out that landing page that they set up for Bikes or Death. That way they know that I sent you there, and they can track it with their real, little robots. All right, well, we are Also brought to you by Kuat Bike Racks. I'm an ambassador for Kuat. And when I was doing my research for this episode of the podcast, I found out that my guest, Kate Boyle, is sponsored by Kuat. And I've told you before about Kuat's excellent customer service, about how I lost my key in a Mexican food restaurant and they sent me a new one free of charge. And that's something that they'll do for all customers. But they also stand behind their athletes. As you will hear on this episode, on Christmas Eve of 2018, Kate Boyle was involved in a really bad car wreck, left her with a lot of injuries and a long road to recovery. And through that whole time, Kuat continue to sponsor Kate. They started sponsoring her in 2017. She was at the height of her career, a 24-hour world champion in 2018. She also got the women's record on the Arizona Trail 300. So it's easy for a company or a brand to sponsor an athlete when they're at the top of their career. But how about when they get hit by a car? 
Kuat stuck with her through the whole thing, continued to support her and sponsor her. And I just thought that was super cool that, you know, I didn't know that whenever I uh, put this podcast together. Kuat didn't know that uh, Kate was going to be on the show or anything. Um, It just kind of happened. And I thought that was worth sharing. You know, I can really get behind a, a company that supports athletes. When something like that goes down, obviously Kate has been able to come back from that accident and I think probably made her supporters really proud. Um, So next time you're looking for a rack that supports one of your greatest investments, your bicycle, think about Kuat because you love your bike. My guest today is one and only Kate Boyle. She has had a interesting couple of years. We're going to talk about some of the struggles that she's gone through in addition to COVID, which we're all experiencing. Uh, She was hit by a car on Christmas Eve in 2018 at the height of her career when things were going so well. She was in a car accident that took her out of, oh, everything, walking, (laughs) you know, everything. Uh, She had to do serious rehab. And uh, it's amazing that she's been able to come back. And I can say she's back because uh, just a few weeks ago, she was able to set a new FKT on the Cocapelli Trail, taking away the record that was held for seven years by Rebecca Rush. I think she only beat it by like 25 minutes. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, but super cool to see her progress over the last couple of years. She's worked through um, a lot of adversity physically and I'm sure mentally to get back to where she is. So it was great to uh, catch up with her and hear about that journey and especially about her recent FKT. Um, so shout out to her. Congrats to her on that. And also might as well throw in our friend Kurt Refsnyder, who also knocked out the men's FKT uh, alongside her. So another FKT uh, episode back to back. All right, well, that's it. Let's have Miles Arbor take it away with the Bikes or Death theme song. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You let that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. Caitlin, you're back. Or do you prefer Kate, I guess? Uh, really either Kate or Caitlin. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> you're back. Uh, so for everybody listening, you were on the podcast earlier this year, I think in like March, but the audio file was no bueno. Uh, we don't know exactly what happened and we had to toss it out. So this is Kate Boyle, take two. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And I was thinking about last time we chatted, I think it was in the middle of like the nearly nationwide stay at home order. And so much has happened since then. Yeah, I'm I'm actually kind of, I mean, I don't know if I'm glad that we lost that audio file, but a little bit happier times and we have some funner things to talk about um, than we did last time. But before we get into it, I was uh, I was curious about this canoe trip that you said you're going on next week. Where are you going? Yeah, I'm going to go float uh, the Green River in Labyrinth Canyon from Green River, Utah to Mineral Bottom, right by Canyonlands National Park. How many miles is that, do you know? It's 68 miles, and it's all flat water. My best friends and boyfriend Will and I, we're we're going in two canoes, bringing our dogs, and the plan is to sleep a lot, hike a lot. (laughs) Float a lot. <laughs> stay warm. <laughs> yeah, stay warm. Are you uh are you still in Idaho? I am right now, yeah. It's cold as hell there right now. Or I guess yeah. not cold as hell. That's a bad <laughs> it's, just, <laughs> it's just cold. <laughs> it's cold. It's um it's in that time of year where it's like maybe above freezing, maybe below freezing, maybe snowing, maybe raining. And so yeah. it's just not 
lovely. It's a yeah. great place, but this is not the lovely time. <laughs> not, not, not this time of year. I love a good river trip. I was wondering, since you are in Idaho, I know it gets really cold and kind of mm. gloomy there. Uh, you just came off the FKT in, in Utah or the Cocopelli Trail there in Utah where the weather was nice. And it sounds like you got another one planned. Is that your reward? Is that trip your like reward for finishing yeah. the Cocopelli and getting the FKT? Yeah, this whole month since that ride um, on Cocopelli, that was just uh, November 6th, I believe. And so I got on my bike once this week just to ride with a friend and otherwise I haven't ridden and it's the rest of this month is just kind of relax, relaxing and resting and resetting before getting ready for next year. And so this canoe trip's kind of the end of that. It's, it'll be a good yeah. opportunity to get away from the car and the cell phone and the email. And yes. it, yeah, I, oh, need it. <laughs> I love it. Everyone does. I bet every, I, yeah, everyone does at some point or another, um, for sure. And, uh, I'm only a little bit jealous. You're making me want to plan another river trip. Yeah. Well, where you are, I mean, that sounds amazing. The Rio Grande down there, that's been on my list for so long. And it's just such a long drive from here, mm. even Arizona. It's like a 24 hour drive. So yeah, it's nine hours Stop just from me, nine or 12, depending on which <laughs> part I'm going to. So yeah, I mean, it's not close to anything and, and it's on my bucket list for sure. I have several friends that have done multi-day uh, river trips out there, but Man, every time I get out there, I just want to ride my bike. You know, it's part of the problem if you drive all that way. But what we've been talking about doing is doing like a, you know, doing maybe two or three days on a bike and then two or three days on the river and getting a little bit of both to to do both of them next time we go down there. So for anyone who doesn't know, I mean, you just came off the Cocopelli Trail. You got the FKT. Previously, it was held by Rebecca Rush. She set that in 2013. So it's been there for seven years. Mm -hmm. And am I right that you only beat her record by 25 minutes? Yeah, it was 25 minutes. And yeah, I was really psyched with that. I mean, for me going into it, I had not raced an ultra in nearly two, well, actually a full two years since 24 Hour Worlds. And so I had no idea what my body would be capable of. Like obviously chasing a record would be ideal. And I just was ready to finish it no matter if it was taking me 20 something hours. And so I was really psyched with how it all um, unfolded. Yeah. And yeah. The seven year old records a long time for that to stand. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's crazy how close it was too. Before we get into that though, I let's set the stage and, and give a little brief history. So you alluded to the fact it's been two years, you know, why don't you give us a snapshot of what your life and especially like in terms of your racing career, you know, where you were at on the morning of Christmas Eve, when you woke up in 2018, you know, what, where were you at? And then obviously, you know, we'll get into your accident and kind of what's yeah. taken place since then. Well, at the end of 2018, like around Christmas, I was just feeling like my career was really as a ultra mountain bike racer was really taking off. That year had been pretty huge for me. I had set a course record at 24 hours of Old Pueblo with 18 laps, which is 300 miles. And then just about two months later, took 11 hours off the women's record on the Arizona Trail 300 at the fourth fastest time finishing ever, which was really, I think a huge career highlight because it showed me or I showed myself that I could race with the top men in the sport. And so I was super motivated to really pursue that in yeah. next, the following year. And then in October, 2018, I had won the 24 hour world championships in Scotland. And so, yeah, it's really easy to kind of take some downtime and be like, all right, I'm going to crush 2019. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Christmas Eve, I was in a car accident here in the Teton Valley that I was really lucky to live through and survive. Um, it is the sort of car accident that kill people. And I ended up with only <laughs> a shattered pelvis and broken sacrum and ruptured bladder and was in the hospital for nine days. And yeah, that completely changed the last two years for me. Yeah, I, I, and I'm sure many people followed along on social media. You were really good about, I guess, taking advantage of the situation and really being very vulnerable and very like open about like what you were going through. And so a lot of us kind of got to watch that process, but for people who aren't familiar, can you tell us like, you know, what the next months or the recovery process was like? Yeah, I think, um, 
in a way I felt like I kind of had to be vulnerable because otherwise I think it could have been a really isolating and lonely and scary experience. And, you know, having so being able to share my story and recovery along the way, was really an incredible way for the community to support me. And I'm so grateful for that because I got, by sharing my story, I got so much encouragement and support and, um, to share a little bit about what that initial recovery looked like. I, yeah, I was in the hospital for nine days. My pelvis was stabilized with an external fixator, which is a pretty wild thing. Like if you were to imagine just having a towel rack mounted to your hips, yeah. <laughs> that's what it looked like. And I had pins in my sacrum and then I was in a wheelchair for five weeks and then crutches for another five or six. And this so, is one of those things where they didn't even know if you would walk again. Is that right? There was some well, uncertainty as to, you know, no, where they, no, if so, they'd be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Or what? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, when my, when my accident happened, I didn't have feeling of my legs or, and my, my pelvis was just burning and it was really like bad burning sort of way. And so I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if I was paralyzed or from in my legs or not. And so I didn't, there was uncertainty in my own experience until Christmas day um, when the orthopedic surgeon came in and he was confident that I would be able to have a full recovery. Um, And so that was really a huge boost of belief and motivation as well. Um, And so because of that, that whole time through the wheelchair and the crutches, I was just motivated to have the best recovery possible because when I was in my car not able to feel my legs I had to come to terms with the fact that maybe I wouldn't walk again and that if I didn't my life would still be fine um, and I would find other ways of living a fulfilled and inspired life full of meaning because that's totally possible it would just be really different for me than how my life has been. And if I had the chance for a full recovery, I would make the most of it. And I would do everything I could to come back as like, not just stronger than ever, but also more grateful and do everything with more grace and try to inspire people to be just appreciative for what they have and make the most of like the lives that we have. Yeah. It's easy to take for granted, right? Until you get smashed in a car wreck and you know, (laughs) you're looking at everything you've built, everything you've worked so hard and suffered and accomplished Mm -hmm. and, you know, it could be gone, you know, very, very easily. So certainly uh, inspirational. Um, What, what were your goals on the, at, at the early days? Like, did you set some really lofty goals? Like I'm going to get back to the top or was it more like, I just want to walk again. Like what, what was your motivation to, to, I don't know, just watching. I know it was painful. I know it was hard. I know it was a long road. Um, something had to keep you motivated to keep you pushing through all that. Yeah. I mean, I think first and foremost, like I, knowing that I had the opportunity to, I just wanted to be able to do what I love. And that's really like being able to just move outside and ideally like mountain bikes are really like, I think probably my truest passion, but like, I just love any way of moving outdoors in ideally a multi-day context, whether it's backpacking or running rivers or skiing. And so I just wanted to recover healthily enough to be able to do that comfortably and as, however I felt inspired. And then the like motivation beyond that was like, well, if I can have a full recovery and I, and if it's possible to have these injuries and go back to racing ultras at a really elite level, then like, I want to do that. And I still like, I feel like I have this unfulfilled vision of really showing everyone that like women can race at the top with men in this format of racing. And there are races that I still want to do and goals that I still like, I just felt like I had not tapped into my potential. And if this accident, I could reframe it as like, this is furthering me tapping into my potential. And so that motivated me. And like, I think that I tend to be overly optimistic um, in some ways. And so like, I was like, Oh yeah, maybe like I might race 24 hour worlds in 2019. Like, (laughs) only six months after my car accident, which in retrospect is absurd. (laughs) But sometimes that sort of kind of blind optimism 
as long as when reality sets in, you're still motivated to like find a new reality and new yeah. goal. And I think that can be really motivating. I think you can harness that and hone that also in like these endurance things where you like set goals and things don't go well. And so you have to reframe your mind and still keep pushing yeah. just as hard. Absolutely. And like, it, and I guess it would be similar to the Arizona trail 300. Like I had for that race, I had set a goal of 48 hours. And at some point I probably realized like 48 hours wasn't going to happen, but I have this new opportunity and that's to finish like 11 hours faster than the women's record or like still have a really fast time. And so in the same way with my recovery, like, yeah, there came a point where it's like, yeah, I'm not racing 24 hour worlds six months after shattering my <laughs> pelvis and being in a wheelchair, but I can refocus on goals in 2020. And yeah. then the pandemic happens and I get tendonitis and am again, where'd you get tendonitis? Oh yeah. That was after we chatted in the spring, I guess. So probably right after in late April and May, I developed tendonitis in my hip flexors. So it was very much oh, related to my yeah injuries and really just kind of affirmed that like these sorts of injuries just take a lot of time. Like even though at that point it had been a year since my bones were fully healed, like there's so much connective tissue that needs to heal and re-strengthen, especially for the demands of like really in ultra endurance efforts. Um, and the, yeah, it just takes a lot of time for, your body to process and recover from trauma, like the inflammation oh, yeah. and the fascia and yeah, it all just, I don't fully understand it except now having lived through it. I know that it just takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. I mean, and continued I, dedication, right. Working through with the physical therapist, continue training, not doing more harm to your body and reverting back to, you know, more damage. I wanted to touch on something that you, uh, you said about, you know, the overall record and being competitive, not just in the women's category, but mm -hmm. you and Lael, I think are really good examples of, of women who are showcasing that in these long distance endurance, you know, side of cycling, it, it's really an equalizer on a lot of levels. I mean, um, so, and as a father of two little girls, I, I'm a big fan of just, you and Leo both watching y'all like crush records. And if y'all can take down a guy, like I'm like, go get him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's fun to watch as a fan. How do how are you feeling now that you're done with the FKT? Obviously physically you are capable of pushing your body. You're, you can put out a really good performance. You've proven that to the world and to yourself, but how are you actually feeling your body? Is it, is it a hundred percent? Where, where do you think you're at compared to 2018 Kate? <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Like I think in a lot of ways, I, it's so hard to look back and say like, where am I compared to 2018? Cause in some ways I'm probably stronger. And I think certainly mentally the, everything I went through with a car accident has probably changed me and my body in ways that like, it'll never be the same. And that's probably not a bad thing. And I think that as far as like physical limitations, like I think shortly after I finished Coca Pelle, the someone there shooting some video was like, Oh, can you say you're recovered now? And I was like, I think I can say I'm recovered with side effects. <laughs> <laughs> and like, yeah, at this point, like Coca Pelle felt like a huge close of a very long two year chapter. And that like, yes, I answered the question, my body will respond well to being asked to ride for a really long time and push a pretty steady and hard pace. And like, there are things I experience now that I didn't before, and I don't think they're limiting, but there are certainly areas to still improve on. And that's mostly like mobility and flexibility in my low back because my sacrum has pins in it. And so it's like essentially uh -huh. fused. And that just requires that the muscles around there are really adapted to that and like able to withstand and kind of handle the demands of really steady, constant movement in the same position, which is what cycling is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's where I am now. And I think that like that, what I found through Coca Pelli was like, I can have that and I can still be really strong and like yeah. I could be stronger than maybe I was in 2018. How exciting was it for you? I mean, not just to get the FKT or, or maybe, but like, you know, there was so much doubt 
over the last two years, so much uncertainty. How good does it feel to be, you know, sitting here now, knowing that you're capable, knowing that your body will respond. And now you can really like pursue other events, I would assume with like a little more confidence and belief that you can do it. So how do you feel about that? It feels amazing. I mean, the reason I chose Coca Pelli this year, I mean, there were a couple of reasons. One, given the pandemic, it was a really attainable and safe way to go time trial something in that I could be self contained and I didn't need a formal event. It worked with the time of year that I was ready to try something. And it was also like this ideal length in that it's not a 24 hour race and it's not the Colorado trail or the Arizona trail that will take days and days. And for me to jump into something like that as my first ultra, I think like it could have been just really intense to not have no idea what my body would do after nine hours and go into like a multi-day race. And so Coca Pelle was this sweet spot of it's long enough to have now an idea of what 24 hours would look like, but it's short enough that it was really attainable as a first ultra. And so now that it's over, like I just have this sense of relief and contentment that I haven't had since before my accident. I can imagine. It's unreal now. Like I've taken plenty of recovery weeks and days and the whole time through tendonitis, I was like resting. But this, the last few weeks have been the first time since that car accident that I've just really felt at ease with where I am. And I don't feel like I have to be working towards something specifically recovering. And like, it just feels amazing to be like, well, I don't need to strength train or do PT today or ride my bike today for the sake of getting better. Like, yeah. And you can take a, take a little breath. Totally. And it just feels amazing to be in that space. And then also it feels amazing to know like, yeah, I can plan on events for 2021. And of course, like, I don't know what 24 hours will feel like, but I know that I can do 13 and (laughs) that that is like a huge, huge step toward those other goals. Yeah. It's so happy for me to hear you say that as just a fan, I'm, I'm literally tearing up. Like, (laughs) um, I just, I've just been watching your career and seeing that accident and seeing how hard you've worked and struggled. And I mean, you've, I don't know, it's just, it's so freaking impressive. It's really inspiring. And I'm happy for you that all that hard work is paying off, you know, and now you can kind of put that behind you a little bit and start focusing on more fun things like just racing your bike, hopefully (laughs) a little more laid back than all the craziness that's been going on in the last couple of years. Yeah. How did the Cocapelli attempt take shape? So for people who don't know, you, Kurt, Lael, all went out there together. How long have y'all been planning this? I was just kind of curious how this came on the radar and why y'all decided to do it. Well, so for me, it has been this like kind of next goal for my racing for a while. I don't remember if we talked about it, but I was hoping, I was planning on doing it in June. And that was my kind of why the tendonitis was so frustrating because I was really feeling like I was getting ready for something like that. And so once I developed tendonitis, I put it on the back burner for the fall, sometime in the fall, and then just really started slowly working towards that. And I rebuilt from the tendonitis all summer, just really conservatively. And at some point it was looking like that would happen. And Lail and I have been communicating about meeting up to ride or race together against each other sometime this year and initially we had talked about maybe the Colorado Trail or maybe the Arizona Trail 300 or just something but you know the the way 2020 has gone like we just kept getting different curveballs and and also the my body was a big uncertainty for me I kind of realized at some point that something of those length races would probably not be a good idea for me this year and so then sometime later in the summer, I mentioned to her that I was thinking about Coco Pelli um, in the fall. And she said she would be interested and in to keep her in the loop. It's something a route she's been wanting to go back and ride since she first toured it, I think like in 2012 or sometime around that. So it had yeah. been a while. And Kurt is my coach. And so he knew I was working towards it. And he was up here in Idaho in early September and late August. And we went and did this big week of riding and 
Montana on backcountry rides. And at some point I was like, why don't you do Coca? Like, what are you training for? Why don't you do Coca Pelli? He was like, well, oh, I don't know. And said something about how fast Lachlan's time was. And I was like, well, that shouldn't stop you, you know? Yeah. And so, and he didn't say anything. And then I slowly noticed that he, his training just started to get like Kurt Rep Snyder level crazy. Like, and I was like, okay, he's going to do something. He's going <laughs> to go ride this hard for no reason. And at some point we used to established a date and I reached out to Lil to let her know. She was like, oh yeah, I'll totally come down. Like I'm flying and this is, I think so Lil, like I'm going from here to here and then I'll come up to here and I'll have no real time to like prepare, yeah. but I'm going to do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she's just... I mean, I was so amazed by it because she said something like, I just really am inspired by you and think that you are really talented and I want other people to see that. And so, wow. yeah, she and Rue came up the day before Coca Pelli and Kurt came up from Arizona and I went down from Idaho and we camped the night before and all, and Lael and I started at like 4 15 a.m. and Kurt started a little bit afterwards and yeah, it was really incredible having the three of them there. And it was really inspiring for me for multiple reasons. And it was also like pretty intense for me to be going into Coca Pelli knowing that one, I get to race Lale for the first time ever. Like we had never met in person yeah. before. And I also had this goal of maybe setting a new FKT. And there was also the very real reality that I, my body would be like, yeah, this is going to take a while. You, you <laughs> might have to like stop and sit on the ground and stretch for a while or like yeah, yeah. you might spasm or seize up. And so it was interesting definitely to be going into it. And it was really exciting too. How was it having Lael there? Um, how did the, did y'all race pretty neck and neck? Like how did, how did that go? And um, I'm wondering if like having her there maybe even helped you with the FKT to maybe find another level or whatever. Sometimes having that competition there is good, you know? Yeah. There's no doubt that having like racing other people provides this extrinsic motivation that you don't get if you're doing a true individual time trial. So having Lil there was certainly motivating. We, I mean, we started off and she immediately like climbed up the first hill uh, faster than I knew that I should start off personally. And so I just immediately let her go and was like, okay, well, here we go. Uh -huh. This might just be how it goes, how it is. And for me with all the, like, especially 24 hour races where I've had been able to race other really strong women, like that tends to always be how it starts for me is that I tend to not catch the leader until the middle of the race. And so I kind of thought that might happen, but then after the first kind of flat section, Lail backed off and I just rode by her and really didn't know what to expect then. But climbing up into the LaSalle's in the dark, I just saw her lights kind of like a little farther back and a little farther back. And then I didn't see her again. And, but I also like really believed that she was right behind me the whole time. Yeah. Um, and so in that way, despite looking back every once in a while and not seeing anyone, I thought that I had like a Lail ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was certainly motivating. And, it, uh, and I think it's also the reality of racing ultras is like you just end up alone and you might see someone and you have no idea how close or how far behind they are. Yeah. So y'all didn't have any uh like track leader or anything where you could look at her dot and see where she was in relation to you or anything like that? Well, we had track leaders. Um I didn't have my phone with me. Oh. And so and I didn't have like, Will didn't come out onto the course to see me and like Rue was out shooting photos, but she was a, always a ways away. And I often like would see her car, but not her. And so yeah. like, there was no talking to anyone out there to have that update. And I mean, Kurt passed us both at some point and he just flew by and he's like, <laughs> nice job. And as he like printed up a mountain and I was just like, bye. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Shout out to Kurt, who also got an FKT at the same time, taking down Lachlan. So that was a narrow finish, too. That's crazy. Yeah. And it's funny because it's like, on one hand, like, I think we both took around 25 minutes. I think he might have been around 30 or 20 to 30. Yeah, like similar range of time. Uh -huh. And and it feels narrow in some ways. And then also, I think for how fast those records are, like, I think it's also a, it's I think a lot of time, like at least it, 
for Kurt and Lachlan, like Lachlan had taken a similar amount of time off of Kurt's old record. And I remember Kurt being like, Whoa, that was so much. And then I know that he was like, I don't know if I like, I think that five minutes would have been a huge accomplishment for Kurt to take five minutes off of Lachlan's time. And so I think for him to then ride it in under 11 hours was like, I think he surprised himself as well. Yeah. One neat thing about the Coca Pelli is it's only about 142 miles. So, you know, you don't have to carry much stuff. You can just go light and fast. What was your setup for this race? And yeah, let's start there. Yeah. So I rode my Pivot Mach 4 SL with a 120 mil- millimeter MRP ribbon SL fork, and which is really like my preferred setup, like a full suspension with about 120 millimeters of travel is really my preferred ultra racing setup. And although that road has a lot of road, that route has a lot of road, both graded dirt road and paved road. It also has a good enough chunky, rugged Jeep road that I think that at least my body would be destroyed on a hardtail racing it at that pace. And Lail was asked for my opinion also about which to go with. And I recommended a full suspension. I remember right after she finished, she was like, man, I'm so glad I didn't ride a hardtail. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that's, yeah, just that's a way to go to that bike choice. What about food and, and water. Yeah. yeah so plan for that. I planned for, and I'm trying to think now about what the calories would have been, but I planned for about 50 grams of carbs an hour, which I know is like pretty specific, but I know that's like what my body processes and does really well with. Like I could eat a little bit more, but it becomes quite a chore. And, but that amount keeps me from bonking. And so I think that that's probably around 2,500 to 3000 calories for that amount of time. And water is an tricky one for that route because you start with a 4,000 foot climb. And so obviously like the less you carry the better, and then you descend and there's a water source and then, and that's a stream. And then you climb another 2000 or 2,500 feet. And then you descend a little bit and there's another stream. And then after that, you cross the Colorado river and then about 10 miles later at mile 60, then about 10 miles later around mile 70, you ride right next to the Colorado river Mm -hmm. and that's it for water. And so the water sources are all on the ground, or I guess I'd add, there are a couple more in between the mountain Creek and the river seasonally, but this year there weren't. And so I carried a two liter bladder and two water bottles and I only filled up everything leaving the Colorado river the second time. And otherwise I was just calculating about how much water I needed for those first climbs and then getting to the Colorado river. So I ended up stopping for water three times. I treated my water um, because the Colorado river is pretty gnarly. There's a lot of agriculture above the river or above upstream. And yeah, that was the water plan. How clean was this race for you? Obviously taking down the FKT. I mean, we're getting down so close on these times, right? Like, yeah. How clean was your ride? And do you think you can clean it up and go faster? Like, how did it go? Um, It was really good. Like thinking about it, I don't really, I can't identify any logistical things I would change that would make me go faster. Um, Like I was happy with my tires. I ate the right amount of food, drank the right amount of water. Like we had the things you can't control. Like the weather was wonderful. Like it was never hot. The high was 65 and we had cloud cover all day, which was lovely and so (laughs) rare out there. Right. And not something we even anticipated. We had a nice tailwind. And so I think the main thing that, I could change that's just super minor is that like hour nine, I just like, I started to feel like the wheels were coming off and I probably just should have been eating more earlier. And so I ended up eating a bunch and I just had about an hour period of time where I didn't feel that great in my pace kind of backed off a bit. And so Mm. if I could fuel myself and anticipate that also to just stay focused, then yeah, I think I probably would have been able to save enough time that I probably could have at least, like, I don't think I could go with that fitness. I don't think I could go that much faster, but I'm sure that I could have gone under 12. So maybe like 10 minutes. (laughs) How aware of uh, Rebecca's time were you throughout the race? 
were you watching a clock or were you just going as fast as you could? Um, well, I use one of my strategies for all ultras, no matter the distance is to use like place or landmark based splits as a way of staying focused on the present task at hand. Cause I think that if you start out in an hour two, when you're like, I'm tired, <laughs> if you're thinking about our, the finish line being like another 11 hours away, that can be pretty hard to stay focused on and riding in the present. And so I use the landmarks to identify like, okay, my current task is like getting to the top of the first climb and I'll put a kind of rough time goal on there. And that's like partly informed by my pacing strategy and partly informed by knowing Rebecca's splits. And so, but I also know that like she, like her fitness was incredibly good at that for that distance, like that was a distance that she was really strong at. And so I don't necessarily expect myself to be right there. And so for me in that, like I ended up, I was behind her splits for a little while. And then at some point, I think around where we got out of the La Salles, I ended up around right at them. And then I started to put time into them later in the race. How long do you think your FKT is going to hold up. So hers held up for seven years. Yeah. Any idea how long your yours will hold up? I don't know. I mean, I don't think it'll be seven years. Like, I mean, it could go down next year and I wouldn't be surprised. And I think one of the reasons is that I think that during the pandemic, other really strong pro athletes, I think have seen opportunities in doing kind of more of an FKT style effort as like a legitimate way of challenging yourself and having a really amazing experience and neat result. And so I wouldn't be surprised if I saw other really strong women going after that sort of thing. And I think it especially depends a little bit on what organized events look like next year. But I mean, I'd love to see like Rose Grant go do the Coca Pelle and the white Ram. And I just interviewed uh, Ted King last night who got the FKT at the Arkansas high country race. So that's another example of a pro rider, you know, coming in and laying down some fast times. I think you and Kurt doing it and, and, you know, there's going to be media and, and, you know, bikepacking.com obviously had you all in there. I think it'll probably like pique some people's interest to be like, Oh, you know, Lachlan just set a time Payson Mm -hmm. McElvin just went out. I mean, so that it's been getting a lot of Payson did do it. Did he, or did he not? I can't remember. He has not raced the Coca Pelle. He, I think just this week, maybe went and rode it in two days. Okay. So I would, I would love, I'm sure he will go do it because it's in his backyard more or less. And yeah, he's got that bug now too. (laughs) Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fun. It's fun seeing all different disciplines of cycling coming and, and I don't know, mixing it up a little bit, you know? Yeah. What is next for you? I know it's hard to plan, (laughs) you know, with everything going on, but you know, you've been planning and working this whole time. I got an FKT. So what do you have like another goal that you're now setting? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a lot of goals. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and the first is, and it's, I'm in that interesting time of year where like, it's so easy to think about what's next and be asked about what's next. And so I'm like living this, walking this tightrope between being like right now I'm resting and then I'm going to figure out how to train in Idaho in a way that doesn't burn me out training in winter. And so there's that kind of exciting challenge coming up for the next few months And then starting in the spring, racing wise, like, again, it really depends on if uh, organized events are happening. I would love to do some stage races if they can happen. Pisgah and in North Carolina and single track six in Canada are on my radar for stage races. But then I think regardless of the pandemic, there are some opportunities that I'm planning on pursuing and one is kind of like riding this wave of the kind of shorter fkt like something like coca pelle like you can do a full day of like one day events you can do a lot more of them than long many day events in a year as far as the toll on your body and so there are some other routes that are kind of backcountry oriented routes that either have a really tiny fkt history or don't have one yet that yeah. i'm looking forward to kind of going and trying out 
that's one of the opportunities that's been born from COVID is people are looking for different things, obviously not group uh, sanctioned racing, some of that's going on, but not as much certainly. So uh, it's kind of opening up interesting and new opportunities, you know, that's kind of fun to watch. I hate to do this, but I have to go pick up my daughter from yeah. uh, from daycare. I feel so bad uh, cutting yeah. it off early, but I'm so glad we got a chance to connect again. And uh, finally, we'll get to put out a uh, episode with, with Kate Boyle. For anybody who wants to follow along, how can they uh, follow along on social media? Or I know you have a blog as well. Yeah, so social media, I am at Kate, K-A-I-T dot Boyle, B-O-Y-L-E. My website is www.imkate.com, and that's one of my mantras for racing and recovering. Um, <laughs> and then I think a bigger picture, bikepackingroots.org is the nonprofit that I've co-founded with Kurt Repsnyder, and that's really where a lot of the off-the-bike work happens um, in my world for trying to make bikepacking and be- really backcountry riding more accessible for yeah. all. So. Yeah, and we appreciate that. I talk about bikepacking routes all the time, and this Thank is a you. good time. I know you to, do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I appreciate you know, it. It's it, it's it's hugely important. Um, we need your group to advocate for cyclists. Um, it's a good time to plug that on my web store. Everything you buy through Bikes for Death, we set up a one percent for the BIPOC uh, Adventure Grant Grant Program that y'all set up. So, um, yeah, thank you yeah, so much. Well, of course, happy to do it. It's such a great program. And it's so cool to see that not only me, but so many people in the industry have been so supportive of that program and, and, and overall bike packing routes as well. We, I, I know it's been growing. Y'all brought on some new people. So y'all are doing the, the mountain bike Lord's work. The, the cycling <laughs> gods work. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing it. I appreciate yeah, it. Happily. Well, good to catch up, Kate. Congratulations again. And hopefully we'll get a chance to chat again. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, my pleasure. Have a good one. You too. Bye. All right, all right. Kate Boyle, everyone. I feel so bad that um, that episode was cut so short. <laughs> True. I don't know what it is with, with her and I trying to connect, but back in March, we recorded an hour-long episode. The audio file couldn't be salvaged, and... It was sad that we had to throw it in the trash. We finally get around to recording another episode. And this time, it we had all kinds of audio issues. It took us like 30 minutes to get set up for the podcast. And I had to go pick up my daughter from daycare. Can't really be late for that. She's four. So, you know, living the dad life. Had to go do that, obviously. That was uh, important. Um, so I apologize to Kate for not having as much time as I would like and to you. We didn't get to go as deep uh, as I'd like to. Uh, you all know I, I'm not shy to throw out a long episode every once in a while. But nevertheless, super cool to uh, catch up with her. And I know we'll be chatting again soon. All right, everybody. I hate to tell you, but this is going to be the last episode for 2020. I'm going to be taking off the rest of the month, getting my poop in a group so I can uh, tackle 2021 head on. I've got big plans as I always do. So I leave you with this final episode for 2020. This will make 31 episodes for the year, which is going to be about 44 hours of audio entertainment tickling your earbuds and your imagination with cycling stories, inspirational tales, and bad jokes. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I say it all the time, but I'll never stop being grateful to the listeners, the people who are the reason why I'm even talking into a microphone right now, sitting in my dining room looking around at an empty house, but knowing that there are thousands and thousands of people all over the world who listen to this. It's so cool. So glad that you're here and so stoked that I get to be in this position to um, to share these stories with you. I do this because I love it. I love the people. I love the sport and I love the community. And I'm so grateful that I get to be in this position to share these stories with you. Um, So hang tight, treat each other right, don't fight, and ride your damn bike. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. 
you could be with your friends or you could be alone you ride for a day or maybe more you just love being in the great outdoors everything you need is strapped to your boss including that new pillow you got from santa claus and then you think oh shit to yourself you left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf bikes Oh, yeah.